Today, if you've got your Bibles, why don't you take them out, turn them to Proverbs chapter 3. And while you're turning there, uh, let me just tell you, we're we are in week two of a series I began called My Choice. My Choice. And, uh, you know, we all have choices we make, don't we? Yes, we do. Many times we make wrong choices, but we make choices, right? What we're doing in this series is we're actually looking at the, the choices that we make, four big choices that we make. Uh, there's many more that we make, but I'm looking at four big ones. Why? Because basically the sum total of the choices we make and the choices that you make today determine who you will become tomorrow. The things you decide in your life have effects that last forever, don't they? Sometimes choices can affect you in horrible ways. Sometimes they can affect you in positive ways. We want to hit on a couple of big ones. Uh, and, and I wanted to focus on those four big ones uh, over, the, over the next, it'll be now two weeks after this week, so the last four weeks, total of four weeks. But last week, we looked at the, the whole idea of the choice we have between a, a purpose, God's purpose in our lives, over popularity. Because so many times, we choose what others around us care about. We, take, we need to be taking God's purposes over what we want in our lives. And how many of you know that what we want isn't necessarily what God wants for us, right? It's not always so, is it? Next week, then, I'm going to be looking at the, the idea that we need to choose discipline over regrets. Choosing discipline over regrets. And we can choose the pain of discipline or, 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 or we can, without a doubt, face the pain and experience the pain of regret in our lives due to the choices we make. Can I get an amen somewhere in the house on that one? That's next week. I'm sure you'll want to be here for that because that's really an exciting topic. Everybody loves discipline, don't we? Not even, not even. This week, though, this week uh, in, in, uh, on the big choices that we face every day, uh, and, and it's one that really all of us will end up facing uh, and, and, and making in different areas of our lives all the time, and, and it's when we choose to uh, pick surrender over control. Say surrender over control. Say that for me. Over control. Yeah, that's a fun one, right? Everybody likes to surrender instead of control because let's face it, how many of you would have to agree with me that you might have a little bit of an issue with control in your life? Some of you are waving hard. Some of you are resisting really hard the, the idea of not grabbing that neighbor's hand and putting it up in the air for them who didn't say, I have control issues. And what's happening is, is if that's you, you need to take some notes today because you really got an issue with control. Jesus wants to set you free. He really does. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I'm not, but you know what I'm saying, right? You just might have a problem with control in your life. I'd say all of us battle control in some areas, wouldn't you? I don't, I don't care if you think you do or not. We all do in some areas. Maybe it's at work. And, and you know, when you're, you're trying to, to, in work, help somebody and you want them to do it your way and your way only, right? Because your way is the right way, isn't it? And if you don't do it my way, then what's going to happen is I'll do it myself and you can just go over there and sit down because it's going to be my way. Or at home, anybody ever hear their mom say, everything has its place. Please put everything away, right? Don't touch. Or here's, here's one. I actually saw this one uh, this week from one of our folks in our church. They had taken a photo, and, uh, and they were so excited because they said, you know what? Seeing carpet lines so straight just makes my heart happy. Anybody love straight carpet lines? Oh, y'all are lying. Y'all know you do. You love it when those lines are looking all symmetrical in your carpeting, don't you? Oh, come on. Am I the only one who thinks that? Y'all are not going to admit it, but it's true. And, uh, you know, vacuum lines, eh, they're just vacuum lines, right? They look nice. But what's really important is when your yard has all of those lines lined up with the mower. Now, that one's truly important, right? <laughs> all the guys, yeah, right, that's right. Those lines are truly important. You know, when you see a nice field manicured and done right, it's just the lines are amazing. It's so good, right? We got a problem with control people, let me tell you. You know, or, or when, we, when we want to control our spouses or we want to control our kids or we want to control uh, the things around our, our, our home and our neighborhood, everyone's got their thing, don't they? For some people, maybe it's the kitchen. You know, some ladies or guys have, a, have more laws regarding their kitchen than the Pharisees had for the Jews. 
right? And they had over 600. And so some of y'all got some rules in that kitchen, don't you? And some don't care about the kitchen at all. The only thing you really want is to control everything else, right? Control is a part of us. It's a part of who we are. We want to control the house. We want to control the schedule. We want to control the, the, the drive. We want to control the remote control. Isn't it interesting you call it a remote control? You've got to control the remote control. We love the remote control. It's not about what's on, is it? It's about what might be on. Anybody have a scroller in their house that they don't ever really watch anything, but they scan, 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 scroll, 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 scroll. I'm like, will you land on something already, Teresa? You know, because she's what might be on is more important than what's currently on. And I'm just like, oh, driving me nuts. So what I want to do today, what I really want to do today is to deal uh, head on with the issue in our lives of control, because it's, it's really kind of fun to make fun of it, isn't it? Because we all got it in us, and if you say you don't, then I know you do. But if we dive in and we find that the reality is that, that we're trying to control something that's not yours to control, you realize that there are some things we try to control that are really not ours to control. And what actually is happening is, is it's a big reflection of a much larger spiritual problem that we're facing in our lives because what we are trying to do by controlling this, one area of our life is really, in essence, we're trying to be, in some areas like that, trying to be like God. I want to control because I know what's best over what God's not. Now, I'm not talking about whether or not you got carpet lines. I'm talking some bigger control issues that we have in our lives. We want to do what we want, not what God has for us to do. You know what I'm saying? And we're trying to take control away from God in our lives. And it's interesting because when we gave our life to God, a lot of us, we, we even use the term, I surrendered my life to God. If you surrender to something, aren't you giving control over? Yeah. And yet we keep trying to take control back in our lives. So what I want to do today is to start with one of the most misquoted and one of the most popular verses ever found in the Bible which is also one of the most challenging for us to live out in our daily, everyday lives. Even if you've heard this verse a hundred times, I just want to encourage you to hear it today as if maybe you're hearing it for the very first time, all right? If you've, if you've ever heard it before. And, and I want you to ask God, just in your heart and in your mind as we're going through this today, I want you to ask God to help me to live out these powerful truths in my life. So you have your Bible open to Proverbs chapter 3, don't you? Great. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 5. Verse 5 starts off by saying, trust in the Lord. And when it says trust in the Lord, he's actually referring to surrender to God. Be completely uh, in His hands, releasing yourself, your will, your desires to Him. Trust in the Lord with, with how much of your heart? Three quarters? A portion, right? Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, all your hearts. And, and where this is where it gets a little bit harder for us when we start doing that, because then it says, lean not on your own understanding. Don't go with what you know. Don't trust in what you know, what you understand to know, what you're thinking. you got to lean on God, not yourself. Lean not on your understandings. You don't know about you, but uh, I know that when I want to figure it out, I, I want to be in control, I want to understand it, I want to do it myself, right? I, I, I want to know what's going to happen, when and how and where. That's typical in us. But he's saying, don't lean on your own understanding. And then he goes on to say, in all your ways, everybody likes the next word right here, submit to God. The Hebrew word submit, if you're looking there at that word, when you go in and look at it, uh, translated, it's to acknowledge, because some translations actually say acknowledge, but it's also to know. And the same word that's used there is used in, in terms of Adam knowing Eve. It's, it's more of an intimacy, knowing beyond that. How many of you would say that you know what your spouse is going to do before they do it in any given situation because you've been married a while, right? You pretty much know what they're going to... It's that intimate knowing he says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. Lean not on your own understanding. Submit to God. And then it goes on to wrap it up by saying, and He will make your paths straight. 
So here's the problem. Here's the problem. And, and I see it in my life, and I'm guessing you probably see it in your life as well. The more we try to control, the more we're afraid of losing control. True? And the more we become afraid of losing control, the more we try to control. Have you ever noticed that when your life gets chaotic, you control things you normally, or try to control things you normally wouldn't try to control? You try to grab onto things you normally wouldn't grab onto and, and try to micromanage stuff? Yeah, micromanaging is a way of control. Just for those of you who aren't control freaks, but you're micromanagers. <laughs> it's the same. It's just a better term for it, right? It's, it's this little cycle that happens in our lives in controlling and, and the way we roll in it. And in reality, we're working to kind of remove God and his decisions from the process because we think we've got it figured out, right? We kind of say, I've got this. God, you can go ahead and take a break. I know what I've got. I've got this one. Been here before. <laughs> we're going to handle it again. And, and God's thinking, yeah, you were here before. How did it turn out last time for you? You're like, I got this, God. I learned last time. Didn't learn last time, did you? There's a lot of illustrations within the Bible of people uh, taking control and it not turning out so good, right? There's, there, it's all through it. I'll just pick out a couple. You think about Judas and how much he wanted to control the money uh, for the disciples. How'd that work out for him? Not so good, right? Or you have uh, Peter. And Peter wanted to control whether or not Jesus got arrested and it didn't really help and help work out too well for him either. Or, uh, you know, when you think about the Israelites, and one of the things that just baffles my mind, they have God, and they're, they're following God's laws and God's rules and all the things that God puts out for them, and, and he's a good and loving God and speaks through the prophets and in the Old Testament. And, and so what do they decide? You know what? They look around at the other nations. They're like, but they got a king. God, can we have a king like the other nations? And so they choose to have a king over what God had for them. We are, we're constantly in this idea of trying to be in control. And all of these situations and so many more in, in our lives, it, it shows us when control goes bad. You ever had control go bad? Nobody's admitting to it. No, never had that one. Yeah, we have. We've all had moments when control goes bad. I want to show you a situation that just screams control gone bad. What I want to show you is that some examples in the lives of uh, Abram and Sarai. All right, so Old Testament still, we're hanging out there today. Abram and Sarai, later known as Abraham and Sarah. In, in, in one situation, Abraham lied to uh, some people uh, by telling some folks that this is my sister. His wife was very beautiful and he was afraid that they were going to kill him and take and capture his wife. So instead he lied and he took control of the situation and said, this is my sister, not my wife. And it kind of went bad for him. It didn't go so well. Um, but probably one of the best examples in their life of, of control gone bad was when they were childless, all right, and really wanting a family more than anything else. And God had given Abraham a promise, or Abram a promise, right? He said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you the father of many nations. That's quite a promise. That's quite a blessing. That's quite a thing that God could do. Do you think? Abraham could have done that on his own? Probably not. But then guess what happened? He has this wonderful promise. Guess what happened after that? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Actually, for quite a while, nothing happened. And, and I can imagine he and his wife talking, and, and you, know, you know, I thought God said that he was going to bless us with numerous children, as many as the, as the nations and the stars in the heavens and a month goes by and still no child. And another month goes by, still no. Pretty soon a year goes by and the years start racking up. So Sarai, after having no success at getting pregnant and having the child, based on the blessing that God had given them, she decides it's taking way too long and having this promise looming, uh, I, I'm going to take control of the situation here and, and help out God's blessing on our lives. And thus, we have this great example of what we would call control gone bad. Genesis chapter 16, turn your Bibles over there. You're going to want to see this. Genesis chapter 16, and we're going to start reading in verse 1 today. In 16.1, it says this here. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him, no, everybody say no children, no children. How many children? None. But she had an Egyptian slave 
named Hagar. Everybody say Hagar. Nice name for a daughter, right? Maybe not. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. So why don't you go sleep with my slave? All right. So what does she do? She's taking control of the situation. God's not doing it in the timing that I think it needs to be done. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have you go and take care of this and have you sleep with my slave. And we'll start our family from that. She goes on to say, perhaps I can build a family through her. Perhaps who? Who could build a family? Did, did that say? I. Perhaps I can build a family. Is that God? That I is her. Perhaps I can build a family through her. God's not doing what he said he was going to do. And, and I've got a plan and I think it'll work out. And, and so I want you to go sleep with Hagar and we'll start a family that way. And it's going to work out just wonderful. And Abraham, it says, agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar. She conceived. God made a promise. His timing didn't fit what Sarai thought it was supposed to fit. So they took control and it got really ugly, didn't it? It got bad. And if you're unaware of what happened in this story, let me share with you a little bit about it. Because most of us know the good part, that eventually she did give birth, and eventually she did have a, a, a nation, the nation of Israel that we know today. But many of you may not know or focus on the not-so-good part of the story. See, it's quite amazing how this one situation, this one choice, this one decision that they decided to make to overrule what God had said, ended up negatively impacting the Jews for centuries. This one decision. Check this out. Hagar, who was an Egyptian slave, right? And got pregnant and had a son. And his, her son's name was, anybody remember? Ishmael. Thank you. And then later, we have Sarah, Abram's wife, got pregnant and gave birth to a son. And we know the name was Isaac. Okay, let me bring this up a little further now. Glancing at the lineage of Ishmael and Isaac, what we see is something that's quite amazing. Control gone bad. From Ishmael, we have modern-day Palestinians today. Who are the Jews in constant battle with today? Palestinians, aren't they? You also have out of Ishmael the prophet Muhammad and the Muslims. Okay? One choice brought that on, didn't it? On, conversely on that, we have from Isaac, we have a Jewish nation, and you have Jesus Christ who came out. We have modern Christianity today. Centuries later, we still find the tensions between the Palestinians and the Jews happening all the time. And do we follow Muhammad or do we follow Christ? We follow Christ, don't we? Why did this happen? Why did this occur? Because somebody decided to take control of a situation and it went bad. They decided to step outside of what God had said and it still affects people to this day. Isn't that amazing? It's so amazing. And when you think about decisions you're making, choices you're choosing, things you're choosing for yourself, or mm, they're, they're for yourself, but they're affecting generations of lives within your family. Let me just tell you that. When you're choosing things, it affects your children. If it affects your children, isn't it going to affect your grandchildren? Won't it affect your great-grandchildren? The decisions you make today have generations of effects. One of the big lessons that we can learn from this, you might want to write this down if you're taking notes today, big lesson, whatever you do, don't ever forget don't ever sleep with a woman named Hagar. Who isn't your wife? Now, if your wife's named Hagar, that's a whole other thing. But if you do, it could go bad, okay? Chances are, this will never be an option for you to choose, finding that Hagar person. But I know, and you know, that we're going to be tempted with something, aren't we? 
we're going to be tempted to control a situation in our lives, right? And I don't know who needs to hear this today, but I know somebody does. It, it may be a single Christian gal who's looking for a single Christian guy. And you know what? Single Christian guys seem to be hard to come by that they may want. And so suddenly they decide, you know what? A single Christian guy, how about we just find a single guy? And we skip the Christian part. You know, and I know it's not right that we shouldn't be unequally yoked, but you know what? He's a really good guy. I mean, have you seen the shoulders? Have you, you know, he's a nice, he's got a wonderful personality. And I, I think I could get him to know Christ. I think I could help him to, to become saved. I think suddenly we do this I, 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 I thing, and suddenly it's all about our decisions and not God's, isn't it? Or maybe, maybe one of the things you deal with is you're struggling with your finances. You know that happens. It happens, and, and we get into those situations, and we're like, I know I'm supposed to give the Lord my 10%, the first 10% of my income and honor Him with that, but man, I'm just so over my head in debt, and I can't financially do this, and I, I don't know what to do, and it's so hard, and, 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 and uh, you know, I, I, I'm just going to have to back off on that and start doing this, and I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm going to take control. You know what? I need to get control of my finances and do it my way because this other thing isn't working for me. You know, and, and I, I, I've already screwed up my finances. I, I, I'm going to do so much better this time because I got it all figured out now, right? Instead of doing it God's way. I, 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 I. Or maybe you're, you're having a hard time with taking control of, of people at work and you're micromanaging some people there or, or they're not doing it right. And so you want them to do it this way and you, you just push them aside and move out of the way. Let me, I, 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 I got this. I'm going to do this. I, 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 I can take care of this. When I was... When I was youth pastoring here um, years back, you can ask some of my former youth, um, every Tuesday we would, um, we would come, I would pick them up at schools, and I would bring them here, and we'd spend time praying uh, after school for about a half an hour to 40 minutes for our service the next night, and then we'd set up the chairs in the gym for service and the sound system and the, the drums and everything. We'd get it all set up, and uh, it never failed, you know, because the student's never going to quite set the chairs up right, you know what I'm saying? So it... it I needed to make sure that they were all. So I went back after, after every setup time and made sure they were set right. D didn't I? Didn't I do that? Yes, I did. They're both nodding their heads. They're here. And, and they came up with a Nicky, nickname for me, and uh, it was Picky Parker. And uh, so, because, I mean, if it's not straight, it's not straight, right? Yes, I have a problem with control. Or maybe you're a helicopter parent. You ever, had, you ever met a helicopter parent, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're the ones doing the homework for you. Some kids are like, yes, right? Because you want to, they want you to do well and they want you to get it right. Or if it's a science project here, you're, no, you're going to mess this up. Move aside. Let me finish this for you. And we get in and we finish up the science project because it's not going to be right. And if they get that science project wrong, then they may never get into a good college. And, and you know, it, it's just this, this thing that's going to happen. And, and your teacher was mean to you. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Uh, you know, I can't believe they told you to sit down when everybody else was sitting down. That's just wrong. Or, you know, or the helicopter parent who says, you know what, can you go get the mail, but don't forget to put your helmet and knee pads on before you go out to get it, okay? Because we tend to want to control, don't we? <laughs> You're like, no, I don't, Pastor. Yes, you do. It's okay. We all do. Just admit it, all right? Here's an interesting thing. There was a Huffington Post article that came out, and it was regarding recent college graduates. They found that employees who interviewed underage under, uh, interviewed people for jobs under the age of 25 found that 8% of those people under the age of 25 who are college graduates who came in for the interview brought their mommy or daddy in with them for the interview. I think we have a problem with control. Let's do this for a quick minute, all right? For your own self. Take this, take this moment and just think about this, will you? Maybe if you're taking notes, you can write it down. Name something, not out loud. No, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Name what you're trying to control. Because we all have them. All right? We all have them. Maybe you can jot it down on a piece of paper, and that's fine. Name what you're trying to control. It may be your kids. It, it may be a person. It may be a thing. It may be something at, at work. It, I, it doesn't matter. I just want you to actually, because until you put a name on it, it's really not going to be real for you, right? Name something you're trying to control. Maybe it is your kids, or maybe you're trying to control your grandkids because your kids are not doing a very good job of raising your grandkids like you think they should. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your job future. Maybe it's your spouse. 
you know, because they sit and they slouch, or maybe they eat with their mouth open. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's a coworker or an image that you think you need to have. Maybe it's your financial future or your, your whatever. Just name it. Just put something down, all right? What is it you're trying to control? Now, for, for you who didn't write anything down, you're actually kind of proving my point here because uh, some of you are thinking to yourself, well, that's a stupid illustration. I'm not about to write something down I'm trying to control. You know why? Because you're trying to control the situation. Just go ahead and try to stay in control. See how it works for you. It doesn't. So what are we supposed to do? with this situation, with this issue of control in our lives, because we all face it, whether we admit it or not, we need to ask ourselves, is this something I'm supposed to control? Or is this something I'm supposed to choose to surrender over to the Lord? Remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him, and He is going to make your paths straight, right? So we have to kind of ask ourselves some questions. So what I did is, is I, wanted to, I put together three simple questions to kind of guide you on what you, what you should control and what you shouldn't control, because there's things we should and there's things that God should. True? So I've got three questions that can help you choose to surrender over control. All right, here they are. You ready? The first one is this. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Half of you are ready. The rest of you are like, I am not going here, preacher. All right? The first one is this. Is it worth my concern? Is the thing that I'm dealing with, the thing that I'm having a hard time with, uh, uh, trying to control, is it really worth my concern? See, there are many things that people are upset about, but it's not really completely worth the concern that they're putting into it. Here's an example, all right? As a leader, as a pastor uh, of a church, there are many ministries and leaders and volunteer leaders that work alongside of me uh, in, in, the, in the churches that I work in. Like in my last church, I'll use my last church. In my last church, uh, I had leadership oversight over a large number of ministries. It'd be like the kids. I had oversight of the kids over the youth, over marriage ministries, over small groups, over men's ministries, women's ministries, worship, graphic arts, video arts, over Sunday service ministry teams, over web development, maintenance, missions trips, custodial, and the list goes on. You're like, oh my goodness. No, I didn't run them all. I had oversight over all of them, okay? And, and in doing that, it could go very wrong for me if I decided to do something. Do you think there was a time in any of those ministries that I was not excited about maybe a way they were doing something? I would say so, don't you think? There's usually somebody doing something that I'm not totally... It's not the way I would do it. So as a leader, when I would meet with my staff or my volunteer leaders, I needed to be wise in how I dealt with them uh, because I, I didn't want to in any moment um, bring a little bit of um, demoralization to the team. I didn't want to. Yes, there are things that I asked to correct, but I had to choose wisely which ones were worth it and which ones were not. Maybe their personality is not mine and they do things a little differently than I do. That's okay. Do we get to the same end? Are overarching goals the same? Yes. How we get there may be different. And I, I had to be sure that I was not trying to control every item they did, but that we were getting to the same goals through the different ways that they may be doing it. As a leader, I needed to have a tolerance for certain things that might be different than the way I would choose to do it but it still got done. There's strength in differing approaches to ministry, isn't there? We need to be willing to let go of certain things in our lives. In a relationship, talking about maybe husband-wife, maybe friend relationship, maybe dating relationship, you can have control or you can have intimacy, but you can't have both. Did you know that? You can't have both. The real problem is sometimes we get so upset about the things that aren't big and, and, and we make a huge deal out of them. What we're doing is we're actually hurting our relationships around us by doing that because it's not really that big of a deal. I have to ask myself, is it worth my concern? Is that really a big deal worthy of me being so upset about that? You know, uh, uh, let me meddle just a little if I might. I will anyway. 
<laughs> um, we get so worked up, we get so upset, uh, ruining the rest of our day, maybe our week, or even more so in some of our lives. Is it really worth it if we don't fold the towels the same way? It is to some. Boy, they get so upset. You know, you got to start and you fold the big one down, and then you can lay it down and you fold it over that way and it goes down and you do a trifold. That's important to some people. Is it really worth it? In five years, is it really going to matter whether or not the trowels are folded in the proper thing that you wanted them folded? Probably not. Is it really matter if for one day your child's clothes don't really match? <gasps> no. If their hair isn't done quite right, is it really going to matter much? Will it keep them from getting into a college? They're only five, but I mean, that one moment could really be a marker moment in their lives, right? Some of y'all need to chill out just a little bit. You're driving him crazy. You're driving all of us crazy with that. Don't, don't elbow somebody on either side of you. I don't, I'm not even looking because I, I don't want to I don't want to have you. You looked at me when you said that. I, I'm not looking. Just look forward. You know, look at me. Don't elbow. Just look at me. Let, me. let me take this one, okay? You just act like you didn't really notice that I said something that might be something in your family, okay? Don't even do that. Just right here. Eyes on me. As my wife used to say to the children, eyes on me. Eyes on me. There we go. Is it really worth your concern over minor little details? Nah, probably not. See, we're hurting our relationships when we try to control them. Is it really worth that? So that's the first question we have to ask is, is it really worth my concern? The second question we have to ask is, is it mine to control? Is it my situation to control? I think that's a question that uh, Sarai might have wanted to ask in, in a situation she had. Is it really hers to control? Throwing uh, her husband towards her slave girl. Mm, that wasn't hers to control, was it? How many of you know that there's times and situations that we deal with? It, it is, is it mine to control? We have to ask that question. Sometimes the answer is yes, isn't it? Sometimes the answer is yes, that's mine to control, right? If it's yours to control, do something about it. See, there's a big difference that a lot of us have to understand. There's a big difference between surrendering control and relinquishing responsibility. I'm going to say that again because some of you need to write that one down. There's a huge difference between relinquishing, excuse me, surrendering to control and releasing, releasing responsibility, relinquishing responsibility, right? Some things God's not going to do for you. Some things God expects you to do for yourself. Example. You're like, it's tight financially. I just don't know. I, 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 can I, I, I just want to say, God, you know, can, he's going to come through for us and, and he's going to provide for us. Meanwhile, you continue to build up debt on credit cards. You continue to spend things you should never spend and buy things you should never buy. God's looking at you saying, why don't you spend less? It's in your power to control what you spend. Uh, I, I gave you two hands. Maybe go get a second job if you don't have, or get a job in the first place. God is not going to bail you out of every, every situation you put yourself into by making bad choices, is he? He doesn't do that. It's yours to control. Maybe your marriage is struggling and you're thinking, what can I do? It's awful. It's awful. It's horrible. You could adjust your attitude. Did he just say that? Yes, he did. You could go get some counseling. That's in yours to do. You could do that. You could go to some of the marriage small groups that are offered here, you know, and, and gain some new tools in your toolbox to learn how to be better at being married. You know, learn healthy ways to be a spouse. I had one couple in my last church. They were they had been married about 25 or 30 years. And uh and they came in one day, sat down in my office, and sat down and said, You know what, Pastor? I hate him, he hates me. We're going to get a divorce, save our marriage. I'm like, what? And they were dead serious. They'd been in our church all these years. And, and I said, okay, so you have never been to one of our small group marriage classes that we've had? Uh-uh. Have you ever gone to marriage counseling? Uh-uh. Have you ever gone to anything that might enhance or increase or help you to be better spouses for one another? Uh-uh. What are you doing then? How long has this been going on? Oh, years. It's been going on for years. 
and you didn't take the tools that were available to you? No. Well, I, I can tell you now they're divorced, and it didn't make it. Why? Because they didn't really want to change. Maybe you're a single guy or a single gal wanting to be married, and you think, what can I do? How can I do this? You know, and, and in some churches, this, this would make a ton of sense, but uh, maybe you need to put the video game controller down and go get a job, right? Maybe you need to, for some guys, you may need to learn what deodorant in a shower feels like and do your hair. You could brush and floss your teeth. It might be a little easier for you to find someone to, uh, to be involved with as a, as a future mate uh, with those kind of situations. It may help you. You never know, right? It's on you to do it. God's not going to brush your teeth for you, is he? No, he's not. There are things that we are all facing that are ours to control. So don't get me wrong in thinking that we have to give everything over to God because there are some of them that are ours. So we have to do, what we got to do is we got to ask, is it mine to control? If it is, do something about it. If it's not, then we ask ourselves a third and final question today. Here's the third question. You ready for this? Is it worth my concern? Is it mine to control? And here it is. Is it for God alone? Is this one of those areas that I am trying to control that's not mine to control? This, is, this one, is for me, is to surrender to God and God alone. Not to my wife, not to somebody else. I surrender it to God and give Him control. The Apostle Paul had an interesting letter. He was writing to the, the church in Philippi. So if you want to turn to Philippians, you can turn there. We're going to be there in just a second. He was writing a letter to the church in Philippi, and he was trying to encourage them because they were going through some very hard times. Anybody gone through hard times? Okay, read Philippi or Philippians. That'll help you, all right? So he was trying to encourage them. You have to understand, Paul was under house arrest. So he was arrested at home. He was chained to a Roman guard. So no matter where he went, the guard went. They were together at all times. Everything they did, everything he wrote was written with a guard chained to him. So here he is, and he's writing to this church of Philippians in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, and he says this. You know what, folks? Look, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, excuse me, Bob, can you give me a little more arm room here? Pull the chain over. Just got to write. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with what? With thanksgiving, present your request to God. Every situation, not some, every situation, with thanks, present it to God. Every situation, prayer, petition, thankfulness, present it to God. Don't insult God by saying, well, we've tried everything else. I guess we can pray. <sighs> it's a last resort. What are you going to do? You know, it couldn't hurt, I suppose. Right? And yet, how many times do we do that? Imagine God thinking, well, how awful is that? All you got left is me. Sorry, guys. Prayer should never be the last resort. Prayer should always be our first line of offense. First line of trying to give over to God what's going on in our lives. What can we do? We can pray. We can pray. Scripture says we can go boldly before the throne of grace. We have access to God. It's the first thing we should do in any and every situation. And when we go to God with thanksgiving, why? Why? We know that He hears us. Aren't you thankful that we have a God who hears us? Aren't you thankful that you have a God who cares about you and what's going on in your lives? And we know that the Word says He's working all things for good, isn't He? All things together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Are you called? Did God call your name? I need you. Come on, I want you. We're all called. And then it goes on to say, when, when we go to God like that, verse 7 of that same scripture that we were just reading in Philippians says, and the peace of God. The peace of God you can't even understand is going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God that when you don't know what's going on, you need something to happen. God's like, I got you. The peace of God that when everything else is going horrible, you still have this calmness. You know, in the middle of a storm, things that are going crazy in your life, 
You ever have that moment of peace because you know who's in control? I know I have. In the middle of some crazy times, and I have this overwhelming peace, and people look at you like, why aren't you freaking out? Because I know who's in control of my situation, right? That's what Paul is telling us here. He's telling you that when you give God control in your life of the things that you should, there's going to be this peace that comes over you in the crazy times of your life. But when you're trying to control it, when you're trying to hang on to it, when you're trying to do it all on your own, how can he give you peace? He can't. When you're anxious, anybody ever get anxious? Give it to God and ask him, Lord, God, I'm thankful that you're going to give me peace. Let me just say, can you change your spouse? Everybody should say no. Your spouse might be making some really bad decisions or causing chaos in your family. You can't change your spouse. Can God change your spouse? That's for God alone to do. I trust you, God, with my spouse. He's showing you his best while you're dating to try and impress you. And you're thinking, I can change him. He's giving you the best. Once you get married, it's all downhill from there because he's only giving the best to impress you. You can't change your spouse. Only God can. Can you heal your loved one? Are you capable of healing? Oh, I was hoping. No, nobody? You can't heal cancer, can you? Chemo and radiation can do some wonderful things, yeah, but can they heal? God can heal, can't he? God can heal loved ones. Can you control your kid's future? No. You can raise them to try to be the best they can. You can try to threaten them and build up some walls and cause some problems, drive away. Can you control their future? No. Can God control their future? Yeah, He can. You trust God with the things that you have no business trying to control. See, I came here today to tell someone that we're trying to control something you should never try to control. It's time to let it go. It's time to lay it down and trust God. So whatever it is, we go back to where we started in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He's going to make your path straight, isn't He? The question you have to ask yourself, which helps determine what to do is, is it worth my concern? Is it mine to control? Is this for God alone to deal with? Years ago, we used to sing a song. Wonderful song. I haven't sang it for a while. I asked Les to come up and be a part of the song and bring it to us. And so I'm going to invite you to sing it with me. It's called, I Surrender All. Surrender all. Can you sing that with us? Oh, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender.